I invite you to um, open your Bibles to the book of um, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12 as you stand to your feet in reverence to the Lord. Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 in the Word of God. As we know, last week I started a second uh, series and this is uh, studying Matthew chapter 7. Amen. Today we're going to be talking about the golden rule. Somebody say the golden rule. The golden rule, the narrow gate, and the tree and its fruits. We're going to be dealing with those three things today, and I hope and pray that you take something home in your heart, amen, that the Lord's Word would really, really speak to you. Reading Matthew chapter 7, verse 12 in the Word of God. The Bible says, Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much uh, for the Sermon on the Mount. We thank you, Lord, for this chapter, Lord, that... You basically sum up in a nutshell what the Ten Commandments are, Lord. We have to ask ourselves, how do we want to be treated? And we should treat others the same way. I pray, Father God, that you just have your perfect way and will. I pray that our light would shine, Lord God, like never before in this lost and dying world. Help us, Lord God, to be people that would share your word with, with individuals, to really reach out and love, Lord God, and touch hearts all over this, this world that we live in. I pray, Lord God, as I decrease from this pulpit, that you would increase Holy Spirit, have your perfect way and will. I pray that somebody somewhere would get saved today, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Did I forget to dismiss Children's Church? Children's Church is dismissed. Sister Agnes is, it will be doing that today. Amen. The Lord has led me in a direction to teach on Matthew chapter 7. This very important chapter deals with te Jesus teaching on judging others, effective prayer, the golden rule, the narrow gates, the tree and its fruit, true disciples, and building on a solid foundation. Sister uh, Nelly mentioned that this morning. Very, very important what she said. We need to be building on a solid foundation. That's the last part of this chapter. We'll be dealing with that next week. Amen. In Matthew chapters 5 through 7, Jesus gives us the Sermon on the Mount. In chapters 5 and 6, he teaches the Beatitudes about salt and light, about the law, anger, adultery, divorce, about vows, revenge, about loving our enemies. He talks about um, giving to the needy, fasting in prayer, and about money in possessions. Last week in part one of this teaching series, we talked about judging others and how to have effective prayer lives. If you were not here with us, please see the message on our YouTube channel. All of our messages are there. And today we're going to be dealing with the golden rule, the tree and its fruit. Amen. And we're going to be really uh, focusing also on the narrow gate. Somebody say the narrow gate. Somebody say, I choose the narrow gate. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to talk about that. Amen. And by the way, on these, um, these outlines that I prepare to preach and teach the Word of God every Sunday, if you ever want a copy of it, just send me a text message, give me an email address, and I can, I can give one to you. Amen. In case you, 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 you know, you're not taking notes or whatever the case might be. The Bible, once again, says in Matthew 7 and verse 12, in the Living Bible, it puts it this way. It says, do for others what you want them to do for you. This is the teaching of the laws of Moses in a nutshell. Amen? It kind of, Jesus boils it down with what's called the golden rule. Many times we're not sure how to treat somebody, and we got to say, okay, how would I want to be treated in this situation? I want to go ahead and reach out and love and treat somebody else the way that I would like to be treated as well. Amen? In the message version of the Bible, it puts it this way in Matthew 7 and 12. It says, here is a simple rule of thumb guide for behavior. Ask yourself what you want people to do for you, then grab the initiative and do it for them. Add up God's law in prophets, and this is what you get. Amen? Praise the Lord. Glory to God. In the Old Testament, we find the law in the Ten Commandments. It was a, quote, list that people were required to keep. Over and over, the Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, and so forth. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus was asked, Which is the most important commandment? You know, they, how many of you know the religious leaders always tried to trip up Jesus? They always say, Which is, you know, out of all ten, Jesus, what's the, what's the most important one? And the Lord responded, and he says in Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40, he says, Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. How I many know oh, that's, that's loving the Lord 100% completely? Somebody say glory to God. Amen. Praise the Lord. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second, a second is equally important. Love your neighbor, how? 
as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. When I read those, that commandment that Jesus gave, amen, in Matthew 22, I see the cross. I see, first of all, how many know the cross is a vertical piece and it's a horizontal piece, amen? And I see our relationship with God is extremely important, which interwines with our relationship with other people, the horizontal part of the cross. How many know those two beams cross together? If I relate, Jesus said, if you do not forgive others, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. So my relationships with other people here on this earth have an absolute bearing on my relationship with God. Amen? So I want to make sure that my relationship with God is where it should be. Amen? I want to make sure that I'm, Lord, I want to live a life, Father God, to please you, to worship you, to magnify your name, to be used of you in any capacity that you want me to be used of you in. Amen? Praise God. We see here that Jesus changed us, changed us rather from just obeying all the, quote, rules to having a motivation of love toward others, which would automatically have us obey the rules, such as to not commit adultery, not murder someone, or covet, or any of that nature. So Jesus took the list, and he said, I'm changing it all. Now I'm saying you have to have now a motivation of loving other people. See, if I love somebody, I'm not going to commit adultery on them. If I love somebody, I'm not going to murder them. If I love somebody, I'm not going to covet what they have. So Jesus said we have to walk as Christians with the motivation of love, and if we do so, how many of you know that all the other commandments are just going to happen in place? Somebody say praise the Lord. How many of you know the fifth commandment is to honor our mother and father? Amen. That's the only commandment with the promise. We'll have a long life. If we love the Lord, we're going to honor our mother and father. Why would we want, we want to hurt them and so forth? Amen? So how many in our church, we've got to walk with the motivation of love? In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the Bible says we, we need to walk in the Spirit, meaning that the first fruit of the Spirit is love. How many know if we, when we submit to the Holy Spirit of God, He puts love in our heart so we can manifest that love toward other people? Amen? Amen? It's God's love being manifested through you and I. Now, how many know that you and I are the body of Christ? There's somebody here that's a hand this morning. There's somebody here that's a leg, that's a foot, that's a, even a pinky toe. How many know all the parts of the body are very important? And how many know it's up to you and I to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people? Amen. We got to go ahead and say, and invite them to the cross. Invite them. Share the word of God with them. Tell them the good news of Jesus. Amen? Bad news is we have to, either we're going to pay for our sins for an eternity in hell or we're going to say, Jesus, I say yes to you. I want a personal relationship with you. I repent for my sins and I'm going to spend an eternity with you. How I many know the eternity with Jesus is the best choice? I think back in the Old Testament, one of the, um, one of the books in the Old Testament says, I give you a multiple choice. I'm paraphrasing now. I'm giving you a multiple choice. Either choose life or choose death, but I'm telling you right now you need to choose life. It's a multiple choice, and the answer is already there. Amen. Praise God. Matthew 7 and 12, again, in the Living Bible, it says, Do for others what you want them to do for you. This is the teaching of the law of Moses in a nutshell. Amen. So whenever we have to think about something, like I said, we're showing that series of movies, WWJD, what would Jesus do? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. Lord, I'm faced with a decision in life. What would you do? This is kind of a gray area. What would you do, Lord? This is a situation, Lord, I, 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 don't, I don't hear clearly from you, but what would you do, Jesus, in this situation? Many times that just answers our, answers our question. We know we've got to go in the direction that the Lord would want us to go into. Now let's talk about the narrow gate. Somebody say the narrow gate. Jesus said the words in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, and 14, you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. Somebody say the only way I'm getting to heaven is through the narrow gate. The narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. I just feel like somebody is, is uh, uh, this is for somebody today, uh, this came right off the Bible, the road is difficult. How many of you know the Lord said count the cost? For salvation, there's going to be a cost. You know, how many of you know when we accept Jesus, it doesn't mean we're going to be rich and have a lot of money and have all kinds of wealth and all kinds of stuff and never, nothing's ever going to go wrong. I don't know about you, but things go wrong. They do. I still get headaches. Every now and then I still get sick. 
You know, I still got money issues sometimes. You know, all the different problems, amen. But how many you know we have the Lord in our lives? That's the difference. We could get on our knees in prayer and say, Lord, I have this financial situation, Lord, and I know you're going to come through. I am going to go ahead, Lord God, and trust in you. Lord, I know I'm going to get better from that sickness in the name of Jesus, Lord God. I just pray that I have a rapid recovery in that whole thing. Lord, my kids on drugs or whatever the case might be, Lord, I pray that you break the chains of addiction away from them. Bring them back to you, Lord God, whatever it might be. You're going through a situation, but how many you know through those situations you can count it all joy because the Lord is, pro, pro, is, pro, is, 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 is producing patience, endurance, and like you're going to push through and the devil's going to come after you with something else later on. You're going to say, I passed this test over here. I know I'm going to pass that one. Somebody say amen to that. Glory be to God. Amen. God is just so good. Amen. So how do people enter through the wide gate and in, in, end up in hell for all eternity? Life without knowing Jesus Christ personally is the first one I have written down. Now, how many know the gospel is true? The Bible is true. The Bible is the absolute truth. Amen. How many know we have to know that God exists? Amen. God exists, number one. We have to understand and know that if somebody does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, they are not going to go to heaven when they die. And they're not going to just fall asleep and have unconsciousness and, and that's the end of it. They will continue to live on. The soul and the spirit were created to live eternally. The question is, which place do you want to go? Do you want to go to heaven? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the only way to get to heaven. If you want to go to hell, do nothing. Don't have anything to do with Jesus. Just live your life in this temporary world, and when you die, you're going to go to hell for an eternity. Pastor, that's kind of harsh, isn't it? No, that's what this book says, and I'm just the postman. Don't shoot the postman, amen? I'm just telling you what it does say. And I'd rather warn people and make them really think about their eternity now, rather than not say anything and have them die, spend eternity in hell. How about you? Amen? We have to, how many know we got to tell people the truth of the Word of God? There are so many churches preaching this wealth and health, you know, and all this other, which is a totally different gospel altogether. They're not mentioning things like sin, repentance, hell. They're not mentioning any of these things. They're just talking about all the good stuff. Amen? But how many know we got to teach and preach what God's Word says? Amen? What our Lord and Savior told us. How, how else can a person go through the wide gate and spend an eternity without God in hell belonging to false religions or cults? False religions or cults the devil has set up so people that are in them and, and members of them think they have the only right way. But in essence, they have the wrong way. How many know there's only one way? We have to know. I always tell people, I encourage them, read the Bible for yourself. Get yourself a Bible. If not, I'll give you one. <laughs> Start with the Gospel of John. Read it for yourself and understand what it's saying, amen. And how many of you know this book is going to lead you on the right direction? Amen. You can't just take uh, some leader in some church or, or, or some what, whoever and say, well, this is what I think about salvation. It doesn't matter what I think or you think or anyone thinks. What matters is what the Bible says about it. And how many of you know we have to know and understand this is the only book that's going to get us to heaven? Glory be to God, amen. God is just so good. Praise the Lord. So people, another way that people go to hell is some people who go to church and do religious things but have no personal relationship with Jesus. And they've never repented of their sin and having a changed life. Now that's scary. When you have a person who's going to church every Sunday, they might even be going to Bible studies, then so forth and so on. They're going through the, all the religious stuff. But they don't have a personal relationship with Christ. They have never repented from their sin. And they think their church membership, just sign on the dotted line, is going to automatically, I'm in, I'm going to heaven. Why? Because I'm a member of that church. Church membership doesn't get you to heaven. Now, I'm not discounting church attendance. It's very important we attend church. We get together, amen, as a body of Christ, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together. Hebrews 10 and 30, uh, 25 tells us that. But how many you know that we have to know and understand it's a personal relationship with the Lord in order to get to heaven? It's not a, a two-hour time slot on a Sunday morning from 11 to 1 going into church that gets us to heaven. How many you know it's a 24-7 relationship all week long with Jesus? Amen. Praise the Lord. After I get out of here, I don't drive it home. I don't say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to put you on the back shelf now until next Sunday. Are you kidding me? I'm, I'm talking to him on the way home. 
Lord, thank you for a beautiful day today. I know it's raining outside, but we need the rain. Lord, I thank you for a beautiful October day. Thank you for the beautiful, um, you know, all the different colors of the trees. Lord, I thank you for a wonderful service today. Maybe the attendance is down, but I'm still going to praise you anyway. Amen. Thank you, Lord God, for the people watching by live streaming community television. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our hearts and lives. We can always walk in a, in a heart of thanksgiving to the Lord. No matter what's going on in our life, how many of you know we always have to be thanking the Lord? Amen. Praise the Lord. Give him, give him praise. That's good. That's all right. Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5, the Apostle Paul writes, They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. It's a warning. How many of you know just acting religious doesn't get us to heaven? Somebody say glory to God. Amen. It's a relationship with the Lord. That's what he wants. One day he wants to see us face to face for an eternity. That's what he wanted from the beginning in the Garden of Eden. When he created the Garden of Eden, he created a beautiful, beautiful place. He created Adam. And then, of course, we know the story. Adam was put to sleep, and from one of his ribs, Eve was created and so forth. He only put one tree in the garden that was the, the sin of knowledge of good and evil. And, they, and God said, do not eat from that tree. In the day you eat of it, you will surely die. And we know the story. Satan tempted Eve and so forth. She partook of the fruit, gave some to Adam who was with her. And that's when the fall of man came into this world. But how many you know God is making everything go full circle? He is going full. He sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to come from heaven to the earth to fulfill the law. Never one time sinned. He fulfilled the law, even though he was tempted in all points for, us, for him to sin. But he never one time did. And he laid on the cross. He died on the cross willingly. He, did, he, laid, he died sacrificially. How many know the Roman soldiers didn't force him to die? He had the power literally to have angels just wipe them out in like a split second. But he laid down his life sacrificially. And when he was on the cross, the Bible says he took upon all of our sins, past, present, and future, on his shoulders. And he paid the price. He paid the price. But we have a responsibility in this. It's not an automatic, hey, Jesus paid the price. Oh, right. I don't have to do anything, you know. I don't have to have a relationship with him. He's, well, I'm automatically getting there. We have a responsibility in this. That is to acknowledge that God exists, first of all. That is to acknowledge that Jesus Christ does exist, that he came from heaven to the earth. That, that does acknowledge that the Bible is the absolute truth. And to say, Jesus, I invite you into my life to be my personal Lord and Savior. I am a sinner. I have broken your law. There's no way for me to keep your law on my own ability. So I accept your free, uh, your free sacrifice. I accept your forgiveness in my life to be my personal Lord and Savior. Lord, I repent for my sins. I have a change in mind towards sin. I thought doing these things was okay before, but now I agree with your word, the Bible, and now I will repent from that and no longer do those. Hallelujah. Amen? How many of you know it's a changed life? It's a changed life in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? Praise God. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5, in the message version of the Bible, it puts it this way. They'll make a show of religion, but behind the scenes, they're animals. That's how it puts it. Stay clear of these people. In other words, they're not really, you know, they're religious, but they're not having a personal relationship with the Lord. Do you follow what I mean? Amen? Now, let's talk about, that's how you get to the wide gate. Amen? How do people enter the narrow gate in order to get to heaven and be with the Lord for all eternity? Well, I'm going to try to, I, you know, yesterday I was doing a little video upstairs. The Lord put on my heart to try to really, really present the gospel message, the good news, in a very simplified manner that anybody can understand it. The first thing I said in that video was, God has created every one of us. Somebody say, God has created me. We didn't come from an amoeba. We weren't evolved. Our great-grandparents are not chimpanzees or gorillas. Amen. You know, there wasn't a big bang, and all of a sudden, here we are. It didn't happen that way. God has created you and I. In fact, not only created us, he's created you and I in his own image. And that's, I mean, that's, that's an honor. God has created us in his image. So first of all, God, we have to believe in him, obviously, that he exists. He has created us. And how many know we're created with not just a body, but we're created with a soul and a spirit? Now, when we die and we're six feet under in the grave, how many know our soul and spirit is going to continue to have consciousness? We're the immediately to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, is what Paul said concerning Christian people. 
So when we die, we're immediately going to be in the presence of God in heaven or immediately in hell to a horrible place with gnashing of teeth, with regret, with all kinds of horrible, horrible things, lake of fire, darkness, all these different things. And how many know we have to understand, amen, praise God, that the only way to get to heaven is to say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I've broken your law. I cannot keep the Ten Commandments. So therefore, being that I've broken your law, I acknowledge you that you came from heaven to the earth. You fulfilled the law, never one time sinned when you were alive on this earth. You laid down your life sacrificially on the cross, and I receive your forgiveness. I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. And Lord, I repent for my sins, and I want to live for you. How many know that's the gospel in a nutshell? How many know that's the message we need to give people? We need to go ahead and share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So many people need to hear it, amen? And so many people, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, it says that the devil has put blinders upon people's eyes, unbelievers. But thank God, I believe we're here today because those blinders were removed. And one day we said yes to Jesus. One day we said, yes, Lord, I accept you. I believe in you. I accept you to be my personal Lord and Savior. Amen. Somebody say praise the Lord. Amen. Now, I want to do a little, uh, I, I put together a little something here concerning the tree and its fruit. Now, I want you to picture something before we look into this a little bit. How many of you know we're all, if I could use the analogy now, we're all trees? Somebody say I'm a tree. I don't mean literally, okay? I'm not getting weird. <laughs> How many of you know we have fruit? And there's all kinds of different fruit. There's good fruit and there's bad fruit. Whenever somebody sees you, what kind of fruit are they taking from you? In other words, what kind of influence are you as a Christian to other people? Amen? Now, let's read Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 20. The Bible says, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruits. How do we identify false prophets? By their what? By their fruits. That is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit, and a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is chopped down and thrown into the fire. Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. Boy, that puts it pretty clear, amen? amen? Praise the Lord. You can tell who false teachers are by the way they live their personal lives and how they treat others. Anyone can put on an act when in church. But the big question is, how do they live their lives at home behind closed doors? I heard of one person a long time ago, and the, 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 the wife of, of this individual um, um, shared this. The, the man was, a, I believe, he was a deacon or an elder in a church. I don't know what church it was, and I don't even know who it was. But anyway, they said he was a bad example. He went to church, lifted his hands, praise the Lord, I love you, Jesus, hallelujah, glory be to God. And as soon as he got home, he slammed the door behind him, kicked the cat across the room, started using profanity language, and just was a terrible, terrible husband and father. How many know that's being a hypocrite? To be a Christian, how many we got to live the life? It doesn't mean we're perfect. We've got our issues and our sin, sin we got to deal with. But how many know we repent from that and we say, Lord, please forgive me? If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us for our sin and cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. Praise God for that. We'd all be in trouble if that wasn't the case. Okay, one more time, Craig. You do that one more time. That's it. You blew it. Well... I blew it. <laughs> Amen. I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to be, um, uh, you know, weak on sin or anything, but how many, you know, we've got to live to please the Lord. When temptation comes your way, you run from it like Joseph did in the Old Testament. Don't gaze at it like David did on the flat roof that day, looking at his, at his um, neighbors um, taking a bath. You get out of that situation in the name of Jesus and run from it. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And don't put yourself in positions where you are going to be tempted. Somebody say, praise God. How I many you know if you're on a diet, especially a low-carb diet, you don't want to hang out in a pizza shop all the time? Ooh, that looks really good. Mmm, yeah. Well, you're just tempting yourself. You're going to look like a pizza eventually. Somebody say, I don't want to look like a pizza. Amen. Praise God. 
Now, we have to know and understand that when we are truly born-again Christians, the Holy Spirit produces what he produces in us. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 to 25, it says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So how many know there are nine fruit of the Holy Spirit? Amen. This is when we go ahead and we submit to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit then produces this fruit in our hearts and in our lives. Verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of this sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. What does it say? What have we done? We've nailed the passions and desires of our sinful natures to Jesus' cross and we've crucified them there. Amen? How many know something that's crucified can't move? <laughs> Amen? Something that's crucified dies? Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. So how many know, church, we've got to follow the Holy Spirit's leading? We've got to submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Lord, what do you want in my life today? How can I glorify you today? I want to follow you, Lord God. Irregardless of what everyone else is doing, it doesn't matter. I'll pray for them or whatever, but I am going to follow you. It's like the song we sing sometimes. I have decided to follow Jesus. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Never base your salvation or your relationship with Jesus based on somebody else's relationship with Jesus. Because if their relationship goes sour, so is yours going to go sour. You, have to, you and I have to have the attitude, if, they all, if I'm the only one that comes to church on a Sunday morning, I'm still going to praise him, still going to worship, still going to magnify his name. If I'm the only one who's going to serve the Lord, then if I'm the last Christian on this earth, I'm still going to praise him, still going to serve him, still going to magnify his name. Amen. Amen. You have to have that attitude, especially in these last days. Christians are falling by the wayside like this. The devil is at work and he's busy. But how many you know, church, we have to get back to basics, get in this book every single day. A chapter a day helps keep the devil away. Amen. Come to church services when the doors are open. Bible studies, prayer meetings, worship services. You know, share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. Continue to praise the Lord. Have an effective prayer life and magnify his name. So many, so many people are just falling away, but how many of you know, church, we want to answer through what? The narrow gate. Amen? So let's take a few minutes and evaluate ourselves to see what kind of fruit we are. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5 says, Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. Now, Listen to this statement. The quality of our relationships is determined by the fruit we bear. Did you get that? The quality of our relationships is determined by the fruit that we bear. Now, I want to talk about two kinds of fruit. Death in the bad fruit, and I want to talk about life in the good fruit. Somebody say fruit. Now, somebody look at your neighbor and say, we're not saying that you're a fruit cake. We're not implying that at all. Somebody say glory to God. Amen. Now, death and the bad fruit is this, bitter fruit. Have any of us, I'm sure you've tasted bitter fruit accidentally. How many of us have tasted bitter fruit? Amen. Did you ever, did you ever bite into an apple and you're not paying attention? And after you take that bite, you're chewing, and you glance at the apple, and you see half of a worm hanging out of the apple, and it dawned on you, where's the other half? Oh! And you spit it out. Amen? How many know that's not good fruit? It, that, that's bitter. That's bad fruit. So what is bitter fruit? It's bad attitudes, harsh criticism, mean spirit, devious behavior, and broken confidences. That, that's a, you know, how many know we need a good attitude, not a bad attitude? And definitely not a negative attitude. Did you ever notice any negative Nancys in your life? Negative about everything. Oh, praise the Lord. Glory to God. God bless you, sister. Yeah, but it's a rainy day today. I'm not feeling that great. Uh, you know, tomorrow's supposed to be such a beautiful day. Praise the Lord. God is so good. Yeah, but it might rain the following day. Everything is wrong. You look wonderful today. What do you want from me? Why are you saying that? My gosh. Now, that is somebody, when they walk in a room, you want to run away. It's not somebody that you're magnetized. You know, you just want to go off them like a magnet. Wow, praise God. Amen. 
Now, the next thing besides the bitter fruit is the rotten fruit. I'm sure we've bitten into apples that were rotten. You know, the, the outside skin looks pretty good, but you bite into it and it's like, oh, it's all brown, it's gross, it's soft. That's rotten fruit. And that means it's, you have immoral behavior, sexual sins, a dirty mind, shady stories, self-centeredness. That's the rotten fruit, amen? Now, the green or the unripe fruit signifies immature attitudes, pouting, jealousy, envy, strife, fits of rage, and using profanity. How many know that we've got to be careful what we say? How many know the Lord doesn't want us to be um, swearing or using profanity? Amen. Somebody say glory to God. Amen. Amen. Now, what about life in the good fruit? Let's look at the good fruit. We want to focus on that. The sweet fruit. The sweet fruit is the first one out of the three of the good fruit. And that is tenderness. Being tender, having tenderness. Courtesy. Kindness. Compassion. Gentleness. Love that is sincere and without hypocrisy. In other words, when you love somebody, you're not looking to get something back. You're just reaching out and touching someone in the name of Jesus. Amen? When you go to the homeless, you go ahead and you try to help them. You're not looking for anything back. You're being Jesus. The other day I told uh, Sister Agnes, I said, we're going to go visit Jesus today. And she kind of looked at me puzzled and said, what do you mean? Are you going to die? <laughs> so I said, no, no, I don't mean dying. Praise the Lord. I said, we're going to go see a sister that used to come to the church, Diane. Uh, sister Diane Dow, she's in a nursing home now, and she can't get out of the nursing home to come to church, so we're going to go see Jesus today. What are you saying? She's Jesus, Pastor Craig? Jesus said, if you reach out and give a cup of cold water in his name, you just gave it to him. When you go and help encourage somebody, you visit them, you pray for them. You, you know, she likes watermelon. Went to the market basket, bought us some watermelon and brought it to her. She liked uh, cherry uh, candy, sugar-free, so we bought some cherry candies, went and we gave them to her. Her eyes lit up like we just gave her $100,000. But how many of you know we got to reach out to people like that? People that can't give back. We're not looking for nothing back. We're just looking to be the vessels that the Lord wants us to be. Amen? Praise God. Don't ever ignore those things, because how many know the Lord is very pleased when we reach out to others? Amen. Amen? What about fresh fruit? That means that you have purity, integrity, genuine, uh, you're genuine, you, you have goodness in your life, faithfulness, love that is centered on others. And what about ripe fruit? That is, you have joy, peace, patience, deference, preference, forbearance, self-control, love that is tough. Amen? How many know that our behavior towards others will make them feel either better or worse? Amen? How do others feel when you enter a room that they are in? Do they feel like running away or have a good feeling seeing your presence? You know, I, you know we know several people, they, have, they, they enter a room, big, beautiful smile on their face like the room lights up. Amen? It's like, it's like praise God, you know, they got, the, they got the light of the Lord in their heart. Your fruit or your behavior is, in fact, that you can tell a Christian by his behavior. In other words, your fruit is your behavior, and in fact, you can tell a Christian by his behavior. Fruit is made to be consumed not by the tree, but by someone else. Whether you like it or not, whether we intend it or not, others will consume the fruit that we bear. It is a fallacy to think that our behavior in any given situation affects only ourselves. How many of you know if people are picking your fruit every day? Amen. That's a good thing. As you know, that many of you know, I plant a tomato garden every year. You know, I plant the little cherry tomatoes, maybe three plants of those, and then another nine uh, plants of the big tomatoes. And, um, and you know... If, those, if I planted these tomato plants and they grew and the nice ripe tomatoes are on the, are on the vines and, and if I never took the fruit, their purpose would be useless. They, if they could talk to me, they would say, hey, take my tomatoes and enjoy them. That's why I harvest, that's why I went ahead and produced them. How I many you know a, a tree, a nice apple tree wants its apples to be picked and consumed? Do you follow what I'm saying? Our influence is so very important to other people, amen? How we influence them with the gospel, how we influence them with our attitude. So the closer relationships we have with others causes a greater impact and influence on them. This is why our behavior within the confines of our own home is so important. 
Our spouse and our children are constantly consuming our fruit and are being affected positively or negatively by the experience. Since the purpose of a tree is to bear fruit and the purpose of the fruit is to be consumed, we could say that the tree's greatest fulfillment is when this happens. A good tree loves to have its fruit consumed. This is the purpose of its life, as this is what it lives for. We can find no greater joy and no more wonderful fulfillment than to know that our good fruit has added strength and happiness to another's life. Isn't it good that, you know, um, when you're ministering to someone or you're there for them and, and they really appreciate that and they say, you know, your attitude and your, your life has, the Lord has used you to change my life. Amen. The Lord has used you. Amen. Praise God to guide me along and so forth, even though I was going towards a bad direction. It's a good feeling to know that, amen, and to reach out and touch somebody's heart. God intended relationships to be satisfying and fulfilling. Our behavior is judged by the effect it has on other people. How is your behavior affecting the people around you, especially those closest to you? Within every fruit is a seed that gives it the potential to reproduce itself. Within every behavior is the power for that behavior to, repent, uh, to repeat rather, itself in the person being impacted. Your influence will influence someone else to act like you. But the question this morning is, are we acting like Jesus? How I many know we want others to act like the Lord? Amen. So let me ask one of us, each one of us a question as I conclude this message. How do others feel when they are with you? Do they feel good? Or do they feel bad? Are you good fruit this morning or bad fruit this morning? Amen. How many know we want to be good fruit? We want to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit residing in our hearts, residing in our life, and, and just to magnify the Lord and just praise Him. I just want to challenge each one of us here today. Let's share the good news this week with someone. Let's pray that God puts somebody's, someone's heart, uh, you know, someone in your heart concerning, I want to share the gospel with somebody this morning. How can I share the good news? Whether they accept Jesus or not, share the word of God. Make that invitation. Amen. You and I had that invitation one day. If we said yes to Jesus, other people will as well. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's stand to our feet and pray that I'm going to have Sister Marshall Lee come up and give a testimony. Father, we thank you, Lord, and we praise you for this day. I thank you for every person that came out to church this morning. Thank you for those watching by live streaming. I pray, Lord, that those who are not here would be able to be here next Sunday, Lord, to hear your word, to worship you, to praise you, to gather together as your word tells us to do. It's very important that we get together as a church family. And I pray, Father, that you have your perfect way and will in our hearts and lives. Help us to share your word this week with someone. And, Lord, we magnify you. Strengthen us today, we pray, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. Good morning, church. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Glory to God. <clears throat> Hallelujah. I can only imagine. Yes, Lord. <clears throat> oh, bless the name of the Lord Jesus. Glory to God. <laughs> oh, bless the name of the Lord Jesus. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. You know, I'm um, going to sing an old song. And... Um, takes me back to some perspective, you know, some self, self analyzation, you know, when you analyze yourself and uh, when you look around, when you lost everything, everything is gone. Yeah. Can you stand and say that Jesus is enough? Oh, bless the name of the Lord Jesus. You know, our bodies are like, or our lives are like buildings. And we have to be careful the foundation on which we build. Hallelujah. If your foundation is of inferior material, then when the testing and the trials of life come, you will just crumble. Oh, bless the name of the Lord Jesus. But when you are built on a sure foundation... Then when the testing of life comes, hallelujah, glory to God, your foundation will stand ashore. And you can say, after having done all, or lose all, God is enough. Oh, bless the name of the Lord Jesus, glory to God. Will he still be enough? Will you still be able to say he is enough? Yeah? Oh, bless the name of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> 
There is always somebody talking about me. Really, I don't mind. They try to stop and block my progress, and most of the times, the mean things they say don't let me feel bad. Cause I've got a friend who never miss of God, Jesus, of God, Jesus, and he's enough, oh Lord, and he's enough. Save me, that's enough. Feed me, that's enough. Keep me, that's enough. When I'm hungry, he's enough of God, Jesus, of God, Jesus, and he's enough, oh Lord, and he's enough. There are many times when I did not have a dime. I tell nobody but my Lord. My Savior, hear my plea. He comes to see about me. He's my all in all. When you crush me down, Jesus, build me up. Stick by my side when the going get tough. Take care of my enemies when they start to get rough, and that's enough, oh Lord, and that's enough. Save me, that's enough. Feed me, that's enough. Keep me, that's enough. When I'm hungry, he's enough. I've got Jesus, I've got Jesus, and he's enough, oh Lord, and he's enough. Talk about the heart regulator, great emancipator. Jesus says, rebuke me, scorn me, you turn your back on me. God put his loving arms around me. When you crush me down, Jesus, build me up. Stick by my side when the going get tough. Take care of my enemies when they start to get rough. And that's enough, oh Lord, and he's enough. Save me, that's enough. Keep me, that's enough. Feed me, that's enough. When I'm hungry, he's enough. I've got Jesus, I've got Jesus. And he's enough, oh Lord, and he's enough. He saved me, that's enough. Feed me, that's enough. Keep me, that's enough. When I'm hungry, he's enough. I've got Jesus, I've got Jesus. And he's enough. Oh, Lord, and he's enough. I've got Jesus. I've got Jesus. And he's enough. Oh, Lord, and he's enough. Hallelujah. Amen. Take all the diamonds. Take all the pearls. Just leave me with Jesus. He's enough. He is enough. God bless Praise you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hi, everyone. Hope you're having a fantastic day today. My name is Craig Matheson, and I pastor the church here in Haverhill called Changing Lives Christian Church here on Newcomb Street in Haverhill, Massachusetts. And today I want to really share something that is, and I want to simplify this, this message as, as simply as I can possibly simplify it. It's concerning the most important decision that you or I are ever going to make. It's an eternal decision. It's a decision that we will spend an eternity with God. The Bible tells us in the book of John 3 and 16, which I'm sure you've heard many, many times, uh, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have, ever, but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. The King James renders it this way. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now, what does that mean? I want to simplify it as much as I can. First of all, obviously, we all know we were physically born. Here we are. We're physically born. Now, God has created us. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, the first book in the Bible, that he has, that he has created us in his image. In his image. Now, we were not only born with a body, but we also have a soul and a spirit. The soul and the spirit are really the real us. What, I'm, what I mean by that is when we, the soul and spirit were created within us to live eternally. In other words, what's going to happen is when we die, we're going to still have consciousness. When we die, it's not six feet under the ground and that's it, we're done. Our bodies obviously are going to be buried in the grave. However, our soul and our spirit will live on. We will have consciousness 
The Bible tells us that when we die, we're either going to go immediately to heaven or to hell. Now, hell is a horrible place where you don't want to send your worst enemy. Believe me, you don't want anybody to go there. Many times people say, well, I'm going to party in hell with my buddies. It's, it's not like that at all. Believe me. The Bible describes what that horrible place is like. It's a place of darkness, a place of regret, a place of gnashing of teeth, a place of, a place of eternal fire. It, it's not somewhere you ever want to go. Now, this is the whole situation, okay? Way back in the book of Genesis, God created the Garden of Eden, a beautiful place with many, many trees. He created Adam, and he uh, created Eve. And what had happened was he said, Adam and Eve, you can eat of any of these trees you want, but this one tree of the knowledge of good and evil I do not want you to partake of. In the day you eat of it, you'll surely die. What does he mean? They didn't kill over and die physically. They died spiritually. God wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with you and I. Now, what had happened was, since that point in time, the Bible says we've all sinned. We fall short of God's standard. We fall short of his glory, meaning that we cannot keep the Ten Commandments. We've blown it already. We cannot keep God's law. So we got a problem on our hands. Hell is a place where people pay for their sins for an eternity. But I got some good news for you today. Jesus Christ paid the price already for you and for me. The Bible says that God saw that we had a huge problem, and he loves us so much. He, you know, God loves you unconditionally. He loves us so much that he wants us to provide a plan of salvation so you and I could spend eternity with him, even though we blew it back in the Garden of Eden. What did he do? He sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. God the Father sent Jesus Christ from heaven to the earth, born through the Virgin Mary. Jesus lived a perfect life. He never one time sinned. He fulfilled the law for you and for me. The Bible says that Jesus Christ willingly laid down his life on the cross. He laid down his life on the cross. The Roman soldiers didn't force him to, to, to be crucified. He did that willingly. He had the power uh, to get beyond those Roman soldiers, believe me, but he laid down his life. When he was on the cross, he took upon all mankind's sins, past, present, and future, your sins and my sins and everybody's sins, the whole world's sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's what the Bible says. He paid the price. He paid the price on the cross so that you wouldn't have to spend an eternity in hell and I wouldn't have to spend an eternity in hell. We could spend an eternity in heaven with him. Now, what are we? What's our responsibility in all this? The Bible says in the book of, uh, in the book of Romans chapter 10 in verse 9 and 10, it says, if we confess that Jesus is our Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So what do you got to do? First of all, you got to admit First of, well, first of all, you've got to believe that God exists, obviously. None of this is going to happen if you don't even believe he exists. Secondly, you've got to believe the, what Jesus did on the cross and why he did it. Thirdly, you've got to believe what the Bible teaches, and that's what I'm sharing with you as simply as I possibly can. We need a Savior in order to get to heaven. Jesus said it this way in John 14 and verse 6. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. What did he mean by that? Put it in everyday language, you're not getting to heaven if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So, what do you got to do? What do I have to do? You invite Jesus into your life to be a personal Lord and Savior. You say, Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. Lord, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life to be my personal Lord and Savior. <clears throat> Lord, I repent for my sins, meaning that I have a change of my mind and heart about sin because in light of what I've just learned about the Bible and about you and, and you dying on the cross as, as a supreme sacrifice. And I accept you as my personal Lord and Savior. I want to live for you for the rest of my life. You see, <laughs> we can spend an eternity in heaven with the Lord. What does the Bible say about heaven? There's no more tears. There's no more sorrow. There's no more pain. There's no hospitals because they're not needed. There's no disease. There's no heart attacks. There's no strokes. Uh, there's no cancer. None of that exists in heaven. So I want to challenge you today. I want to just really pray that you would listen to, to what I'm saying. The Bible is the absolute truth. Many people are asking themselves these days, what is truth anyway? Well, truth's not relative. In other words, it's not, you know, well, I have a red shirt on. I believe my shirt is red. And you might say, well, I believe your shirt is blue. So somebody else might say, your shirt's purple. And so my truth is different from your truth, but it's all truth. No, it isn't all truth. There's only one real truth, genuine. The shirt's red. <laughs> so we have to understand the Bible is the absolute truth. 
I challenge you to read it, starting with the Gospel of John in the New Testament. The most important decision you're ever going to make is to accept Jesus Christ to be a personal Lord and Savior, to invite him into your life to be a personal Lord and Savior. Jesus, in John chapter 3, was talking to a Pharisee, a very religious man, the Pharisee in the Bible called Nicodemus. Nicodemus went up to Jesus one day and he said, you know, Jesus, I see you doing a lot of miracles. I know there's something really different about you. Tell me, how shall I be saved? Jesus said, you must be born again. Well, good old Nick, Nicodemus, what do you mean? I'm going to go back in my mother's womb and come out again, be born again? What are you talking about? Jesus, no, 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 no. You were born, remember I mentioned earlier, we were born with a body, a soul, and a spirit? Well, we're spiritually dead until the day we accept Jesus into our life to be our personal Lord and Savior. That's why Jesus, that's what he meant when he said, you must be born again. In other words, your spirit, man, inside of you must be born again. How do we become born again? By receiving Jesus into our life as our personal Lord and Savior, believing in him. So I just want to encourage you. I don't know who's watching out there. I'm just a guy, you know, sharing what I've read in this book over the last 20, I'm sorry, over the last 48 years since I've been a Christian. And so I just want to encourage you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I pray that you would just have a personal relationship with him, believe what the Bible says, you know, and really, really know that when you die one day, you're going to spend eternity with him in heaven. Just say, Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I ask you right now to come into my life to be my personal Lord and Savior. I repent for my sins, Lord. I pray that you give me this new life in you so that one day when I die, and I know I will have consciousness, even after my body dies, I will spend an eternity with you. Because you see, folks, your soul and your spirit will live on. You'll have consciousness even after you die. Your body's going to go six feet under in the grave, but you're going to continue to exist. God bless you, and I pray that you have a wonderful day today.